someone or call them, like, hey, come get on the stream. It's really good. And, you know, today is a great day. This morning we're doing our water baptism, actually, in both services. We are. I'm excited. Are you excited? Yes, excited. I think you're getting baptized. Yes, this, sir. You? Yeah, I, I can't wait. Um, if, if you are one of those candidates that signed up for baptism, what's going to happen with this is at the end of the, toward the end of the service, pastor will basically dismiss you out and you'll go out into the social hall and, uh, and you'll have more information there, how you can get changed and get, get prepared and they'll tell you how to line up and everything then in the order we're going to be doing that in. But I am so excited for you and the families that come out this morning to witness this and be a part of this one, man, great, 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 um, I don't say ceremony, it is a ceremony, but, but just a, a symbol of what God has already done in their lives. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. I'm excited about it. What else we have, Sydney? Our summer programs are starting June 1st, and we're kicking it off with a block party. So everyone's invited. It's going to be really fun, have water slides and food and games. It's for everyone, not just the kids. So yeah. it's what I, what I, we, we have some fresh hamburgers, all right? I don't, I, what I mean by that is we ain't we buying a box up to Artie from Sam's. You know, we're, we're, we're going to patty them ourselves. They're going to be good hamburgers, little little. We're going to smash them down, smash burgers, I think what you call them. But so we're going to have hamburgers, a few hot dogs for those who absolutely refuse to eat a hamburger, just for those picky people. But, but uh, and then uh, all the condiments and stuff is going to go with it. I believe we're going to have ice cream. Uh, we're going to have some ice cream, different, different varieties of ice cream out here. The water slide, be prepared to get wet. And my recommendation to you, if you've never been to one of these type events here at Bay Harbor, is even if you don't prepare to get wet, you might get a little damp. Because a lot of kids like to come up soaking wet and give the big hugs. You know what I'm talking about? So just be ready for that. Uh, just, let's just come out and have a good time. There's no agenda. We're literally going to come to the house, come, into the, come to the property, and not in the house, come to the property, hang out, goof off, have, just, just kick off summer together, doing life, connecting together. It is one of our connect night things we're doing here at the church. Been doing it all year long, but it's connect, um, and uh, I can't wait. And then June 8th, which is the Wednesday after that, is we're starting our JC Games. Yeah, JC Games kicking off. Now, that is for the pre-K through the sixth graders doing JC Games, and the seventh grade and above is doing sink or swim here with the youth group, and Pastor Joey just looked at me when I said he will make sure I got it right, but they're going to be having a good time. They're going to have games, snacks, um, and matter of fact, we are actually going to be having food for the students. That's all the students. All, there'll be a meal prior to service starting at 615 every Wednesday night this summer. Um, can't guarantee we'll do it after summer, but through the summer, 615, bring your student, drop them off, let them grab, grab a hot meal, and then from there we'll disperse the classes. So uh, just so you know that, it's been a while since we've done Wednesday night dinners on campus, so it's going to be a little different with this, the students, but, uh, but it's going to be good. And then the JC Games, the shirts are for sale. You can yeah. pre-order them up to June 1st, which is next, next or this, this Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, this Wednesday. Yeah. It, and it, then they're $10. Cheaper. Yep. yep. And then after that, select, like, sizes, and they're, they go up to 15. Yeah, so make sure you pre-order your shirt if you want your shirt. Um, and, and I think the the, I, the plans are to get those two, the ones who pre-order by the 8th, as long as everything works out, and that'll happen. But but make sure you pre-order that shirt by June the 1st. It's simple to do. If you can't figure it out by going to church app, clicking on the tab. If you need help with that, holler at somebody. Um, holler at one of anybody that's younger than 12 can probably help you with that easier than anybody older than 12 because they're better electronics, aren't they? Yeah, well, you are too, but yeah. Anyway, are you ready to get into worship? I know I am. Yep. Are you guys ready? Everybody, why don't you stand your feet and let's worship God together this morning and just give him the worship and the, and the, that he is due. Good morning. Come on, let's go ahead and give the Lord worship before we even start playing notes this morning. We worship you, Father. You're worthy. Aren't you glad that he rescued you? Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my too till I met you. Well, I was breathing, but not alive. was my truth till I met you. You called my name.
the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. And now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. And then you call my name. I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. You call my Praise the Lord. Put your hands together for him this morning. Father, we love you this morning. Praise the Lord. You may be seated for a quick moment if you would like to. I want to take a minute and welcome you into this house. You could be anywhere in the world this morning that you could possibly make it to, but you chose to be in this house this morning with us. Thank you so much. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, if you would share this live stream, get it plastered. We have a wonderful service prepared. Uh, it's going to be different again today. If you see behind me, we have the baptismal tub. So I want to start there. If you are one of those candidates this morning who is going to be getting baptized toward the end of the service, pastor will dismiss you and you just go out, go around here to the social hall and you'll meet somebody that will give you more information on how to prepare yourself and and what's going to happen from there. So toward the end of service, he'll say, go, and you do that. Sound good? Didn't want to forget to give you that information. But if you are a guest with us for the first time this morning, if you would see in the chair pocket in front of you, there's a guest card. If you'll grab that card and just fill out as much of the information that you feel comfortable doing so, take it to the back of the sanctuary. I believe Miss Stacy's back there. She has a gift that she wants to share with you, or we want to share with you. She's going to be the one giving it to you, but we want to share it with you. And if you are watching online, if you'll just go to our app and fill out the hit the connect tab, you can fill out a little form there too. We'll send you that gift as well. But we do thank you so much for joining us. That same chair pocket, there's a giving envelope. And here at Bay Harbor, many ways you can give and in uh, and, and many ways you do give. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord and, and the cause that Bay Harbor does all over the, all over the continent. Um, it, it, speaking of that, you don't want to miss here soon. There's going to be some, uh, some, the Wednesday night charging stations where you're going to see some stuff about other continents that Bay Harbor is sewing into. So be sure you be looking forward to that. But, uh, but you can, you can text the number, you can, um, you can go to the church app, the church website, or you can place it in the black boxes at, at the back doors. You can do it now or you can do it on the way out, either way. But we do thank you for your faithfulness and giving. And, uh, um, a few quick announcements I want to share with you. This Wednesday is kicking off the summer, and we're going to have a block party here at the church. We say block party. Yeah, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a good time. It is one of our connect nights. What that means is we're, there's no agenda. You're going to come hang out with us. Um, we're going to have hamburgers, a few hot dogs. We're going to have some ice cream. We're going to have some water slides. We're going to have some games. And we're just going to have a good time. So make sure you prepare for that. That is not just students. That's everybody. Come out and fellowship and just hang with us and, and just have a wonderful time. And to segue into that, JC Games is starting soon, as well as our sink or swim for our youth group. All right, so that's going to be every Wednesday night throughout the summer, and we will be having dinner, pre dinner prepared for our students at 6.15. That'll start every Wednesday night. You don't want to miss that. Go and make plans now, and it's going to be a good time, as always, here on the campus. But I think the student, the kids are doing like a Fruitful Ninja type thing or Faithful Ninja. I don't know. So it'd be fun. Make sure you get them here and uh, be prepared for that. But, uh, but I'm ready to get back into worship, won't you guys? I know I Why don't you stand with me to your feet this morning? Father, we love you this morning. And God, I ask you, Lord, that right now you would invade this space that we are in. Father, as we begin to lift you up, as we begin to exalt you, Lord, for, for all that you are worthy of, God, I ask that you would just move this morning. Father, we love you. We praise you. Amen. Let the King of my heart be 
talks about the goodness of God. This morning, maybe you're in a situation where you don't feel the goodness of God. But God is good no matter how we feel. He's good no matter our circumstance this morning. And what I love about this first verse, it says, may, it, may God be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. When you have nothing to propel you, nothing to uphold you, nothing to sustain you, we have Jesus. And He's more than enough. He's not just enough to get us by until things work out. He's more than enough. So this morning, whether you're on the mountain or in the valley, we're going to worship Him from right where we are this morning. Here we go. Let's sing that first verse all together again. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, He is my song. Let the your voice this morning for his goodness we thank you father you're good you're good we declare your good this morning we worship you jesus we worship you father. this next song uh, is called 
good, good father. And I wasn't going to say anything. But I think today is such a beautiful day to sing this song and throw it into the atmosphere. Because for everybody being baptized in the room, this song is saying that he is a good father. That though, sorry, Dad, your earthly father can fail. He can let you down. He may not show up when you want him to show up. But this song is saying... God is there with me. He is walking alongside me and he is holding my hand and he will sustain me through my life. When my earthly father may not be here anymore, that relationship will sustain me beyond this life. So through this next song, if you are being baptized, I just encourage you to dwell in these lyrics and to reflect on the good life that he has provided for you and the great life that is ahead of you. So we can just sing this song.
And don't you love him this morning? If you will, lift up your hands and your voices to him. Acknowledgement that the Father is in the house. He's close to us today. He is here. If you would, just remain standing for a little bit longer. And if you want to, you can turn with me. I'll let you guess where we're going this morning. But Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Be reading three verses here, verses 9, 10, and 11. So grateful that you have decided to come out and to worship with us on this holiday weekend, a long weekend. You could be in a lot of different places, but you're not. You're here. You're here in the house of the Lord. And it's not by coincidence or accident that you are. And so we've enjoyed the worship a little bit different this morning. Nicole, appreciate you leading. And uh, also glad to... Um, Glad to have Emma back with us and in the lineup. Um, she graduated from school in Florida, at Lead in Florida, and so we're glad to have her back. And, um, and we know that when her dad is not here, she's going to be okay. So uh, let's read the word of the Lord. Now just go ahead and take a deep breath this morning. You are as exciting, my darling, as a mare among Pharaoh's stallions. How lovely are your cheeks. Your earrings set them afire. How lovely. See, I'm getting some amens this morning. <laughs> they, they all seem to be in a deep voice, but they're amens. How lovely is your neck, enhanced by a string of jewels. We will make for you earrings of gold and beads of silver. Whew. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. And Father, we just ask that you would settle in this place, that the divine presence of a holy God would just be with us today, bringing transformation and change into our lives that only you can bring. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this gathering. We thank you for those who are watching us right now in real time all over the world. But Father, we also thank you for those that are going to be catching this broadcast at just the precise moment that they need to hear it the most. And Father, we thank you that you are a God who is not only here, but you're in the future as well. Thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, would you watch this video with us? to the brave men and women who stood up for freedom, who answered the call and fought for our nation, who paid the ultimate price and never came back. To the American soldier, we thank you. 
to the mothers and fathers who raised a hero, to the brothers and sisters with an empty space, to the sons and daughters who have only memories, to the wives and husbands who bear the void with pride, to all who've lost a soldier they love, no gift could repay your sacrifice. No tribute could match our admiration. No word can contain our gratitude. But still, it deserves to be said. We remember you. We salute you. And we honor you today. Today is more than just a, a bumper in a service. This whole weekend is about the freedom that we get to experience because of the sacrifice that somebody else made to ensure that. Just out of curiosity in this house today, and if you're online, you can help us with this as well. In the comments section, you can leave um, just a note. Just put a person's name in there. But if you know someone personally who has paid the ultimate price in dying for their country, would you stand? That could be somebody that you serve with. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. You know someone personally who gave their life. Today, we think not only about the ones who left us, but we think about you as well. We think about what it is that you have faced and what you've gone through, and so we honor not only them and their memory, but today we honor you, and um, our hearts go out because it is the ones who are closest that are impacted the most. For those of you that have served in the military, thank you. Thank you. And I challenge you not to just let this weekend go by, but do something. It's one thing for us to personally reflect on the sacrifices that others have made. It's something different for us to reach out to the ones that you saw standing and the countless others who are not. And so I challenge you to do something. Yesterday was the sixth year in a row that I did something personally. I always do the Murph workout and... Um, and so you can look that up and find out more about that. But really what it does through that whole time, and I get emotional. And I know that people think I'm crazy in the gym, and, and, but, but to, to be part of that, to think about the ones who have lost loved ones and, and comrades and people there is just my way of doing something, and you can do something. It might not be a workout, but maybe for you it is a phone call to someone that says, you know what, I haven't forgotten, and I know where you are. I look at my mother-in-law who is here this morning who has experienced that loss firsthand with uh, a brother in Vietnam who lost his life and other brothers who have served. And so um, you can do that. You can pick up a meal for someone. You can pay for their lunch or do something special. But whatever it is, do something. And I know you're wondering, well, how in the world is he going to tie Memorial Day into the Song of Solomon? <laughs> and how do we transition from something that is so serious into something that just, just seems to be frivolous. But I want, to, I want to show you what the Lord is capable of doing. What, what it, where we are right now, if there's ever been a time that a message like this is essential, it is now. When you look at what has happened in our nation just this week and over the past couple of weeks, what's happened at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, uh, Texas, is, is something that never, ever should have happened. 
what happened at the Topps grocery store in New York um, two or three weeks ago, over two weeks ago now, is something that never should have happened. And for us, as I've been thinking about the sacrifice that certain people have made, I can't help but to think that when those men and women died on the battlefield, that this was not the America that they thought that they were dying for. This is something that we can do better and we must do better. And when I think about that, I am reminded of the fact that any significant change that is to happen in our country cannot be left to the government to figure out on its own. There are some legislative change that we can bring. There are certain elements that within us that we can make when it comes to laws and different things like that. But if there is ever going to be a lasting change that's going to take place within our nation, it's not going to come from the government. It's going to come from the church because the church is what God has ordained to be the agents of change within this world. We have been called to be a light who shines forth, illuminating a dark world with the power of the Holy Spirit. It is our responsibility to not just be ones who have a moment of silence. It is not just our responsibility to pray for those who are going through the loss. We are called to be the model of what that change is supposed to look like. Our first and foremost responsibility in this world today as followers of Jesus Christ is to be the model because we are the light of the world. And I love you this morning. I love you this morning. But we got to understand this. If your profession of faith does not match up to your behavior in Christ, then you are not part of the solution, but you're aiding the problem. If the profession of your faith does not match up with your behavior in the Word of God, then you are contributing to the degradation that's happening in our nation. Because how can they look at us to be a light if we're the ones living in darkness? How can they look at us as being the ones who are supposed to bring change when we're not doing it? And it goes beyond just the modeling. It goes beyond our action. So here's the tie-in. What the Lord has been speaking to us over the course of the past seven weeks that we've been on this series, and I don't know that we're going much further. <sighs> but is this. The Lord is drawing his church to a deeper, more intimate relationship with him because we need to be the light. And as he's calling us in, it's not just because I'm trying to help marriages out a little bit, and I don't know that I can preach this much longer. I'm just going to tell you. I think we've got five they're expecting right now. And so we got to move on. But uh, if, if not, somebody's going to be coming after me. So, but what he's doing is he's giving you a warning. And listen prophetically this morning. We will not be prepared for what is coming if we're not living in closeness with him now. And we won't be able to make it when difficult times come because they're not here yet, but they're on their way. But we won't be able to make it if we're not close to him. And so that is what God is doing in the midst of this. So with this, let's look at the text. It is um, an interesting text, and I, I know it seems like that we're going through this soppy love story that's going on, and it's almost like you see in your mom and dad kiss. You know, it's just something else. There's just nothing beautiful about that. Or that you've been married for 30 years, and somebody wants you to watch a four-minute video about you telling a love story to your wife. And uh, that is available to you, by the way. But happy anniversary to these two that are celebrating 30 years of marriage today. <laughs> But I, I have to caution you with this, and, and we're going to move kind of quickly, I hope, this morning. I've been concerned about these messages in general. And the reason for it is when we get to this section where the man is doing the talking, he's describing, he's describing the physical attributes of his wife. And I don't want us to ever think that the Word of God is some chauvinistic book. I don't want us to think there's just a patriotic pages that are male-dominated. Because when we begin to view Scripture, we often default to our worldview. 
we often default to the way that we see it. And I never want anybody to think that the Word of God can only be interpreted through a white, male-dominated lens. Because there's so much more to the Word of God than that. And so for us to fully understand what the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church, we've got to look at it not from our context, but from the context that it was written. And when we do that, we'll find that these words aren't all that strange as they are to us. I would suggest to any of you men who are dating and you in love with your woman, don't use these lines to try to get closer to her because... I wouldn't be brave enough to say to my bride, baby, you're the best looking horse I've ever seen. <laughs> if you're brave enough to do that and live to tell the story, please let me know. But that's where it's coming across, baby. Whew. Mmm. I ain't never seen a horse like you. <laughs> Let's get into the text before I get in trouble. He makes mention that she is a mare among Pharaoh's stallions. Now, the King James doesn't pick this up. The King James just translates it horse. There's nothing fancy about horse. But the New Living gets to the heart of it. And when you break down the Hebrew and you begin to look up the word horse, what it's really saying is it is a female horse, which would be in this case a mare. A mare is a three- to four-year-old horse. And so what he's saying in this is that he, she is like a mare among Pharaoh's stallions. And, and so we, we, we'll see this. And, and where I want to just start, because I, I, you can tell I, there's, there's just so much to say. But we got to get started somewhere, so let's just start at the beginning. And so when we look at this, there is the attractiveness of her. Now, the attractiveness that I see as we begin to break this down is not just in the physical appearance. And that's why I say I don't want this to be some chauvinistic book because, hey, I'm looking at you, you beautiful. And so that's why. I'm going on. There was something deeper that was already established in their relationship that was already there. But we got to admit that the attractiveness is important. If you didn't have attractiveness, if God didn't put attractiveness in us, we wouldn't be here. God established the attractiveness within us because if not, we wouldn't fulfill our purpose to be fruitful and multiply. And if God would have put all the childbearing on men, we wouldn't be here either. Because we couldn't handle the pain. God knows what he's doing. So he put the attractiveness out there because the attractiveness is what draws us. But the attractiveness can't keep us. If you're only basing a relationship on their physical appearance, it's good for a while, but you don't know what's underneath. It's not until you get to know someone that you'll be really begin to be drawn to them. Attract, physical attractiveness will draw you to a person, but will not keep you with a person. And there is something about the attractiveness that's there. You've heard it said, that's a face that only a mother could love. But why is it that what I find to be attractive, you might not find to be attractive? It's because God has put that inside of us. There's a story that went around along with this that when it came to ancient Egypt, that they were in a battle one day, and they, they were known for their horses and their chariots that would pull the horses. And so when they were approaching an enemy, an enemy realized that they were coming, and they were fighting a great battle. And knowing that they might not win the battle, they did the most unusual thing. They released a mare that was in heat. And as they released the mare that was in heat, and the horse began to run in the different direction, guess what happened to the horses in the chariots? They went towards the mare. And so when they began to get off course of what they were doing, it took an Egyptian soldier who went out and shot an arrow to kill the horse to stop it because there was no way for them to get to where they needed to be. See, I believe that as a church, there's something about us, not that we're mares in heat, but what we are is that we should be the distraction to what's going on in the world. So 
whatever people have planned, whatever it is that people are going through, when they're living their lives, the church should be a light in the midst of a dark world that causes the distractions of people. And they look not to us, but they look to Jesus Christ. Because the Word of God says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine before others that they'll see your good works and glorify the Father. There's an attractiveness that happens within this. And I know that Solomon understood this. The writer of the, or who this was written to understood it because he understood two things about horses. One, especially the Egyptian horses. One was that they had great value. These animals were well sought after and valued and they were costly. People would do anything to have these horses. They would build up their arsenals and their military because these horses were so valuable to the, what was going on in the advancement of their nations. We see in 1 Kings chapter 10 that when it describes Solomon, that Solomon and all of his riches, that he established stables for his horses. So many that it's believed that he had over 12,000 Egyptian horses horses at his disposal at any time. This showed just how much money that he had and the opulence of who he was because he had gathered this. And matter of fact, when we go back into the Word of God in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy tells them that when you get into the land, you will want a king. But when you get a king because you want it, make sure that that king does not make wealth for himself, does not chase after foreign gods for himself, and doesn't get horses. The reason why is because God recognized something that if you had the horses that they were so valuable to the efforts of what was going on in the war and in the protection of a nation that the children of Israel would trust in the horses instead of trusting in God. But yet Solomon, in the midst of all of it, he did all three of those things and it led to his demise. They were known for their value. We see that there was a time that Pharaoh actually gave uh, uh, Abraham or Abram horse. He didn't give him horses. He gave him livestock. He gave him everything else, but he didn't give him horses. And it is possible that he didn't do so because he understood him to be a man of peace and not a man of war. We see that went throughout Scripture that as, as they were known, if you had horses that they were so valuable that there was something that happened with them to where they were only for the elite of society. And only the elite would have a horse. And that is why people would, would known to be walking beside them. You think about what happened to Haman in Esther, that he had to ride Mordecai around on a horse because of its value and because of its status in society. It goes on and on about everything that is happening. And so in this, what I see is that when he makes the comparison between her and an Egyptian horse, it is really a compliment to her because there was nothing as valuable as that. And it was common in those times to associate words of affection through the expression of animals. And so it was common. They did a lot of things that we don't do any longer. And that's why it's important for us to understand where they came from. We say, I love you with all my heart. That's not what they said. They said, I love you with all my kidney. It just doesn't have the same vibe to it. We understand what we mean when we say, I love you with all my heart. But the kidney? So there was value that this man saw in his bride. And that's the same way that Jesus views us. This woman saw herself as being nothing more than a dark-skinned, working country girl. She never saw herself any more valuable than that. But yet, when Jesus, when the lover came in, he said, oh, baby, my darling, you got to understand how I see you. It's not important how you view yourself. And it's not really important how others view you. What is essential is the way that God views you. And he sees you as someone who is valuable. So much value do you have in your life that Jesus was willing to die for you. 
how important you are in the kingdom of God. He was worth dying. You were worth dying for. That song comes to mind of Jason Crabb of worth. He thought I was worth saving. He thought I was worth dying for. And that's the way that Jesus sees you. And that's the way that you should see yourself. I quickly want to move on to these other two verses. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about them because I want to give you a connection with all of this. But look at verse 10 with me, <clears throat> excuse me, if you will. Verse 10 says, how lovely are your cheeks, your earrings, they set them on fire, your neck. They're enhanced by the string of, of, of jewels. And, and the point that I want to make with this is that the beauty was already there. The beauty in her was already there. And throughout Scripture, when we look at, at the subject of jewelry, jewelry wasn't always in the negative in Scripture. It was only when the jewelry was in place of the relationship with God and when it was the source of pride in the person's life. That is when jewelry became a problem. And I don't know how even within our movement we ventured so far one way to say, you know what, if that's the way it is, then, then women don't need to be wearing jewelry and men don't need to be having a wedding band. And so we went that way for the longest time. And if we're not careful, we go to the other side of it. But what it is is he's saying it's not really there. And what this man is saying to his bride is the jewels that I I have placed upon your life are, are something that accentuates the beauty that is already there. You've been beautiful all along, but there's something that happens when you're dressed with what I give you that accentuates the beauty that you already have. So he's comparing her to this, these Egyptian horses, and the Egyptian horses were known that at times that they would actually dress them up in all of the jewels, and so it could be argued that when he's saying this, that he's actually describing the horses. You can see a replica of what the horses may have looked like within these pictures. They are so, so decked out in what they were dressed in that it accentuated what was already inside. My, my concern is, is that so many people get to a place because they don't know who they are in Jesus Christ. They don't know their value. They don't know what's going on inside of them. So what they end up doing is they end up trying to make themselves on the outside what they're missing on the inside. If we would ever get to a place of recognizing who we are in Jesus Christ on the inside, then there's a beauty that radiates on the outside. The beauty is what comes from within. The beauty is what's inside of us. And so he's saying, you look like this. And he begins to describe her in the midst of this. There's another characteristic that I want you to see. Is that it's not only that they are valuable, but they were also strong. These horses were known for their strength. If you look and you get your light bill and you see all of the kilowatts that's there, it might make you want to cuss about how bad it is, but how much you've used. And, but it come from James Watts, who was a Scottish engineer. He was building a locomotive uh, engine, and, and he needed a way to market what he was producing. And he went back to a previous work, and in that previous work, he found that there was a way of, of describing just how powerful the engine was by the horses that it is replacing. So he took it and he, he fixed it and he did some research and he came to the conclusion that 33,000 feet or pounds per minute is what one horse could produce. So as he began to multiply that out and see what it would take for the engine to do the same thing, he established what we know today as horsepower. Horsepower is there. And when I checked, the 2022 Ford Mustang Mach-E has underneath the hood 480 horsepower. Now, the 2022 Jeep Rubicon Unlimited, just out of curiosity, has a measly 470 horsepower underneath this engine. Ten, ten horsepower difference. Don't sound like it's a lot. But when you think about there being ten different horses, it is a lot. And so we see that there's this power inside of these beings that God has created. And God made them and he made them with a purpose and he made them with a plan. And there was something special about all of them and the power that they had. 
They, were, they, they would do anything they could to get them because they knew that if we had horses and we had that capability within war, that it would be difficult for any army to try to defeat us. That's why God said in Psalms 20 and 7 that some may trust in horses and some would trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. It's never going to be a horse that's going to replace what it is, but there's a strength inside of that. And I think for far too long the church has set back and we've considered to be the weak ones around society, but God never intended it for us the church to be the weak ones. We are the ones that there is strength inside of us. There's strength within the body of Christ. And that's why during these times right now, we can't sit back and cower into a corner. We've got to stand up victorious in who Jesus Christ is. And though they might come across us with this arsenal of things, we know that because of who he is, there's a change in our lives. And we are the difference that needs to be made in this world today. I look at this woman and you say, well, how does she have strength? Because she struggled with insecurity in herself. Yes, she had insecurity in herself, but it never stopped her from pursuing her love. No matter what, and you'll see throughout the rest of the book, that there will be moments that she will put herself in great risk because of her pursuit of her lover. And that is the same way it should really be with us. I see a strength in her. We look at Jesus sometimes and we think of him as being weak. He rode in in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday for the triumphal entry. And he wasn't sitting on a horse. He was sitting on a donkey. A donkey, a, a, a common man's animal or machine that was known for its humility. But it also had authority. But I don't know about you. I don't know when the last time you've done it. But if you look at the back of the book, not at the middle of the book. But if you look to the back of the book, the word of God says in Revelation chapter 19 that there's coming a time where Jesus is going to come back. And when he comes back, guess what? He's going to be riding on a white horse. It speaks of judgment. It speaks of destiny. But if you'll continue reading that verse, it's not only Jesus that's coming riding on a white horse, but it's going to be the church that's behind him that's riding on the white horses as well. There's power and there's strength in who we are in Jesus Christ. There's power and strength in who we are. But what I see in this woman is I see that she was a woman of courage. That's the strength that she had. Courage is strength on the inside. I like what John Wayne is quoted as saying. He said, courage is when you're scared to death and you still mount the horse. Billy Graham would say that courage is contagious. That when a brave man stands up, it stiffens the spines of others. God has called us to that place. There is, and please listen to me, there is inside of you as a follower of Jesus Christ, there is value and there is strength, both of which you may not think you have, but you do. Well, Pastor, what does this mean to us? I want to quickly, as I close this morning, give you a Jesus connection with this. It's found in an unusual spot, Luke chapter 23. By this time, we're getting into the narrative, and Jesus is led away to be crucified. And with him, it says that there are two revolutionaries. Some translations call them thieves, but what they really are are res revolutionaries who want to overthrow the government. They want to overthrow what was going on. And as they do, <clears throat> they're, they're, they're working in this place. And they begin to scoff, and it really cuts the scene. Because it goes from there into talking about all that's being done around them and how that the crowd is scoffing at Jesus. <clears throat> As it does that, one of them begins to curse at Jesus and make fun of him. But then there is another one. And in that moment, he begins to cry out to the Lord. When he cries out to the Lord, he has an exchange with Jesus. And in this, I see great intimacy. Now, before I show you that verse, I want to go to verse 11. There's something strange in Song of Solomon chapter 1 and verse 11. It says, we, we will make these things for you. Who are we? It has been stretched to say that maybe it was the young women of Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's been 
stretched even further to say that we describes the Elholim, the, 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 the God, uh, uh, the, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit is what this means. But I, I have a hard time seeing that within this passage. But it's likely it's saying we, as in me and you. We will make for you because I want to bless you. And this is something that we're going to do together. It's interesting that gold and silver, neither one can be produced by human hands. So what he's saying is we want to craft something by our hands that has been made by God. And the relationship that God wants to bring us to is that close. And I see this happening in the most unusual of places. As Jesus was dying, he's establishing intimacy with a man who cried out to him. In that one moment, as that man was dying with nothing else to live for, Jesus speaks these words in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. Assuredly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. It doesn't sound very intimate, does it? Maybe not until we begin to break it down. First of all, Jesus says today, this is the timing of intimacy for that man. This was not something that could be pulled off or pointed off tomorrow. This was something that had to be dealt with within that moment. And that's the one thing that I have learned about intimacy is intimacy is not something that's best planned. It is something that's best delivered and being in the moment. There's something about being in the moment. Right now, in this place, you can experience intimacy with Jesus Christ yourself right now. I'm so thankful that I don't have to make appointments with Jesus. I don't have to stand in line like there's some new movie that's coming out just to be able to spend a little bit of time with him. But I get the privilege of engaging him and being engaged by him right now in this moment. So I challenge you not to put off tomorrow what it is that you can do today. Don't think that you're going to have all the time in the world to say and to do what it is that you desire to do and what it is that you want to do because you're not guaranteed anything beyond the breath that you just took. So today is the time. And then we see you. This is the object of intimacy. You. Jesus was speaking to the man, to him the one who already said, I don't deserve any of this. I don't deserve to experience the love that you are pouring out on me. I don't deserve any of that to that one who was guilty, to that one who was filthy, to that one who was at a place that he didn't have no worth inside of himself. That is the object of God's desire for intimacy. It is you. He wants you. No matter what your past has looked like, no matter what you have done, no matter where you've been, no matter the mistakes that you have made, the object of God's intimacy is you. He wants to be with you because he loves you. You will be. This is the guarantee of intimacy, the promise of intimacy. It has been observed that 76 times in the scripture it says, I assure you, or assuredly, or verily, verily. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you the truth. But all 76 times that it's mentioned in scripture, Jesus is the one who says it. I promise you, you will be. The will be is important. If I can, and I know I'm taking a little bit longer this morning, <clears throat> there has been a disservice that has been done to a generation of Americans. There was a generation that grew up that no matter how much they prepared, planned, or performed, that they were given a participation medal for being involved in something. And what's happened, and I'm not blaming that generation, it's us parents. But what happened by us wanting to protect our babies is that when they grew up and got into the wor real world, they realized something. Just because they interviewed for that job didn't mean that they got it. Just because they wanted to go to that school on scholarship didn't mean that they got the scholarship. Just because they participated didn't mean that they were part of everything that went on. And sadly, what has happened is that that cultural thinking has made its way into the church. 
and it has warped our view of eternity. And here's what I mean by that. We have raised a generation that believes now that when you die, you go to heaven. Because what they believe is that I get a participation medal for just being alive on earth. But Jesus has said something different. The guarantee within this of intimacy was reserved for the one who cried out to Jesus. The promise is available to everyone. But it's only the ones who cry out who will receive it. With me. With me. That is the person of intimacy. That is the provider of intimacy. Jesus is saying that what you get is you get access to me. Can you imagine that we get an audience with the one who saved and did everything for us? We get an audience with the one that created the world and put everything in motion. We get an audience to the one who can supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We are the one who get an audience with that's the one that we get to share our intimacy with. Is one who will never leave us. Who will never forsake us. Who will never be unfaithful to us. Who will never cheat on us. Who will never hurt us. We might not understand everything. But we get to have an intimate encounter with the one. And in that moment this man's life was changed in that one moment the man's life was changed because we will be with me in paradise finally this is the place of intimacy it's not a spot on the map it is not some geographical coordinates that lead us to a certain place but it is Jesus himself and I know that there's coming a day where we will be in, with him in paradise. And to that man, it said something. Because to that man, it changed everything. Because he didn't see anything but the hell that he was going through and that he was going to. But when Jesus stepped into his life, he changed everything within that moment. And paradise came to him in that time. Jesus, the, the person and the location of Jesus, uh, of, the, of the intimacy, is the status that we have, the state of where Jesus is. Because no matter where Jesus is, that's where we get to be. If we are close with him, then we are with him. And we are with him in paradise. And how powerful this is. What a thought of the intimacy that Jesus wants to have with you. Just like the woman who didn't see much of herself, the Lord sees something in you. Even in your worst state, the Lord sees something in you because he loves you. Father, we thank you so much for the power of your word. Thank you for establishing within us something that is beautiful and something that is powerful. We pray that you would have your way within this altar service right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching online, we're so grateful that you have joined this conversation. And to all of you today, those of you who are being baptized, if you'll just start making your way out this door right here, we would appreciate it. But, but as, 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 as we look at this, there is, there, there is something that the Lord is, is, is doing. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior in full pardon of your sins, if you've never came to him in salvation, today is the day for you. These candidates that have just left have made that pronouncement of faith. And here at Bay Harbor, one of our core values is we want people to come to Christ. And what that means is, first of all, that you surrender your life to him. That you give everything that you have to Jesus because in the midst of all of that, he has the power to change your life. You may feel like that woman and you may feel as though you have no value or no strength in yourself. But Jesus sees something different. Jesus sees you and he loves you. And you may be like that man who was on the cross and really didn't have much hope and significance. But Jesus says, I, I see something else. You may be at the end of your rope, but that's where I want you. Because I have a plan for your life. 
Don't wander around life aimlessly. Come to him and let him change you. I want to take just a moment in the quietness of this room. I know it may be awkward to you, but in the quietness of this room, search your own life and find out where you are. And if there's things that aren't right between you and the Lord, I, 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 I know it's difficult. But if you'll just get up, make your way here, we'll be here to love on you, to talk with you, to listen to you, to pray with you. Pastor, I, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed. Well, how badly do you really want it? And if you'll just get to a place that you're not worried about what anybody else thinks and just focus on him, there'll be a change that will take place inside of you. God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we bless you today. God, the Holy Spirit is stirring. He's working and moving this morning. God, in the name of Jesus. Good morning, Bay Harbor. We just thank you for uh, joining us this morning. And just remember, do not put off tomorrow what you can do today. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, if you would like to pray with us, or if you would like us to pray with you, if you would call us at 912 262-1227. We would love to uh, pray with you, and we can set something up if you would like to speak to someone. Um, And we just thank y'all for joining in. We love y'all.